Economic Show. Today we have with us Stephen London, who's uh, with us all the way from uh, Australia, right? Australia, Steve, by way of the well, United States. Welcome yeah. to the show. Tell us a bit of your back background. You know, uh, you seem to have a very interesting background in business schools, in uh, uh, film producer, writing books. Uh. It's an odd background, I, I admit, yeah. Including golf caddy and uh, oh, okay. personal trainer, and you know, it's just uh, uh, in, in, in health clubs, in health yeah, and hockey rink supervisor. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> but I, when I got when I got out of the uh, when, I, when I got out of the university, finally after finishing my my doctoral work, I decided to go into business rather than uh, stay in academia. Okay. Uh, but when you're an acad when you get a PhD academics always kind of calls to you. Right. So from time to time I'd go back and spend right. some time in the university right. and I got involved in teaching MBA students and right. uh, and so I've been in and out of university settings right. most of my life. But I I was probably a little early uh, but I came up with this idea of a portfolio of careers. Okay. I didn't want to have a job, I wanted to have a life okay. and so... Have you achieved all the... I, I, at times I've had two or three things going most of my life. I've had right. two or three things that I did and I found that rewarding and I also found it a way to maintain my independence. So, uh, is, yeah. that also, is that also what led you to uh, your latest book, Cats, uh, talking about innovation and having... Uh, uh, I, su I suppose I've, I've had the innovation gene uh, along the way but it really was, it really was working with uh, Actually, it was working with people who were brain injured, brain injured. Uh, brain injured, way, way back. That got me interested in the brain and how it worked, and and that led to uh, you know how does the brain guide you in your decision making, and then that led to why do people do what they do, and how do you escape uh, narrow thinking and confined thinking, and and so over time I. I studied innovation very carefully. I got to know Edward de Bono and Tony Buzan and, and uh, spent some time at a place called IDO, a, a very innovative place in the United States. And, and then finally one day I realized I probably had something to say. Okay. So that's what CATS is. Okay, so CATS, and, and you talk, I mean, you know, many people try innovation, but most of the time companies, you know, that say they want to be innovative failed in doing so. Why is that? Well, I think, I think companies actually uh, believe th in the, what they're saying, innovation, but I think they're very nervous about thing, doing things that are called innovative. So, well, I, I, well, I used to do uh, a lot of uh, seminar work in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the home of 3M. Right. When 3M would ask me to do a, a session on creativity, okay. uh, it, it, it happened. I mean, it was part of their DNA, it was part of their blood. Right. Right. But when some of one of the other major companies would ask it, uh, it almost never happened mm. because you know leadership, yes, change, yes. Yeah. You, you, they, you put it on your calendar, you say it's going to happen. Innovation, they'd kind of back away from it. And I realized that they were really uncomfortable mm -hmm. with uh, some of the things that were done in the name of innovation. There wasn't innovation they were uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. It was some of the activities that trainers, well, like some of the activities that trainers would put a, um, managers through okay. uh, as a part of an innovation training program. For, for a lot of people feel uncomfortable. Like pl having little toys on the table, okay. uh, doing certain kinds of role-playing things. Right, right. I mean, there's a big segment of the business world that if they don't really see a clear connection to, to job uh, or performance, that, and they are, they're asked to do something that makes them uncomfortable okay. because playing as a part of a seminar is very unnatural, yep, yep. Um, you know, they're, gonna, they're just not going to do it. Yeah. So I felt that I needed to make the clear connection between those things which I call provocations right. and uh, and the outcomes that come from it, yep. innovation. Yep. You talk about four key areas of uh, challenges, right? Yes. Uh, in, in, in your book. What, yeah. what are those four areas? The four challenges, uh, pretty straightforward. The challenge of all the busyness and noise around us that okay. distracts us. Right. And when we're distracted, uh, we can't innovate because our mind is consumed with stuff, just doing stuff. Innovators generally find that space, a white space to... They have to. Okay. Have to. Um, they create it for themselves. They create space for themselves. Okay. The uh, the second challenge is the challenge of of uh, being normal and being constrained by regular ways of doing things. Um, not a problem for life. A problem for innovation. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you want to innovate, you have to find ways to get provoke yourself or be provoked. Failure, of course, is a is a threat to innovation because if you get caught up in the fear of failure, you're not going to take risks. Right. You're not going to try right. things. Right. And leadership is a is a, it's a subject that I wasn't sure whether I'd 
tackle or not because it's such a massive subject. But the part of leadership I'm talking about is the part of leadership that has to do with individuals and their innovative uh, uh, performance. So right in that small microcosm, you live as a, as a person in a, le in a sphere that's influenced by a leader. Yep. That leader can make a big difference. I call them cat wranglers. Okay. Uh, and uh, they can make a big difference to the innovation that comes okay. from their people. Speaking about cats, I mean, curiosity killed the cat. Right? It did. So why cats? I mean, uh, that's why. That's why. That's exactly how it happened. I probably had 34 models that I went through along the way: okay. skyscrapers, ships, you know, rocks, uh, layers of the earth. I mean, I had. A, <laughs> I, I was looking a long time for something that made sense, and curiosity killed the cat. Led me to say to myself, "Cats have nine lives," and I said, okay. "That's it." Okay. Cats brings in the idea of curiosity. Mm -hmm. It contains curiosity to kill the cat, which is like and society and saying, don't yep. try anything. Yep. And the nine lives are just they organized around the nine lives. So. And, and you, let's talk about those nine lives. I mean, you say there are nine key steps to innovation. Well, nine, I think there are nine independent and fairly discreet things you can do to become more innovative. Okay. You know? okay. uh, number one, you can create the space that you need okay. to innovate. That's Not, in, that's yeah. in, to counter the, the yeah, Exactly, the exactly. Need. And for other reasons, too. Okay. Sometimes creating space can be pro provocative, so that there's, there's kind of an interplay between them. Okay. Uh, but each one, tackled by itself, can take you in the right direction. Number two, it's uh, important to be prepared for innovation. You don't just come in with a blank slate. You come with something to contribute and something that so you how do, how do you prepare yourself for innovation? Well, one of the things that you can do, and, and this gets to be a little intellectual, but you can prepare your knowledge files so that you have access to them. Okay. So that you're constantly working on whatever your master, whatever you have mastery of, right. whatever your, right. your disciplines are, you're working at keeping them up to date and also accessible. Right, okay. So, so that when I bump, it, yeah, when I kind of connect with you, yep. then that, that. I, I have that and it's part of the interaction. Okay, et cetera. okay. Uh, also part of the preparation is just understanding that you have an area where you want to innovate. What is it? Okay. Be as clear as you can about it. Okay. Uh, focus on it. Yep. The third is just understanding why being normal is a is a challenge. So normal itself is not is not just a challenge, but it's also uh, a life. Okay. Because when you when you uh, really dig into normal, then you are preparing the way for an understanding of the connection to the provocations. So you're saying that innovators are not normal. Innovate, all innovators are normal except when they're innovating. Okay. Then they're escaping it somehow. Okay. Yeah. So th there's a need to get out of normalcy, or, or only in, only when innovation is the is the goal. Most of our life we're, we're comfortably in the norm, day-to-day mm. -day routines, etc. Okay. Yeah. You know, let's let's take a quick break and we'll be right back with Stephen London.